This modern farming technique is called hydroponics. It is the miracle recipe for tomorrow's vertical farms, but the principles of hydroponics have been around for some years now. The very first hydroponic garden that I know of was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. <laughs> many, many years ago. I am not old enough to remember that. And it was a wonder of the world. It was one of the seven wonders of the world, in fact, to see these plants growing not in soil. I guess it occurred to somebody, well, maybe every plant can do this. We just haven't given them the chance. And it turned out to be correct. And the idea did not disappear with that glorious ancient city. Indeed, during the 1980s, one major American institution studied the idea very closely. Its hanging gardens perhaps weren't the seventh wonder of the world, but farmers in white coats managed to grow wheat, salads, and all kinds of fresh vegetables, including the raw materials for the french fries of the future, all without a single gram of earth. Except that these potatoes weren't growing on earth, but in space. Because this American institution is nothing less than NASA. The American Aerospace Agency saw hydroponics as a way to feed the astronauts, who will one day head for Mars. And the quality of the menus here gets a lot of attention. Hi, I'm Michelle Prachonik, and I'm the advanced food lead here at Johnson Space Center. And once we go to Mars, we're going to be able to start growing foods in chambers hydroponically. And we're going to start by growing the fruits and vegetables so that the crew can have fresh, colorful, crunchy salads that will include the tomatoes, carrots, bell peppers, as well as the greens like lettuce and spinach. The application of the technology on Earth is substantial. And I think, uh, Michelle, we can apply this to stuff on Earth as well. We can certainly apply it to, to on Earth. Both the hydroponic growing of crops going to be working on Earth as well as on Mars. On Earth, the progress of hydroponics has gradually seduced the food industry. Today, a new generation of suspended greenhouses is colonizing the roofs of New York for large-scale, off-the-ground food production in the middle of a city. Hydroponics uses about 10% of the water that traditional agriculture uses. So a farm outside is having to constantly irrigate um, or depend on uh, rain, whereas we use very, very little water to accomplish even better growth. Hydroponics saves on water, which is set to become one of the most sought-after resources of the next century, and it also enables increased production on a spectacular scale. Hydroponics is, is wonderful because it allows you to crowd a, a, a large amount of plants into a small space. Our projection is that we'll, we'll be hitting about 100,000 pounds of produce a year, and, and that's great for this a small of, of space that we have here. It's only 6,000 square feet. The way this system works is that we set, we set the, the nutrient level and the pH level of the water to whatever we want it to be for the specific crop, in this case lettuce, and then as needed, it sucks nutrients and acid automatically. The water is pumped up to these individual channels via these small black pipes. This is a water and nutrient concentrate mixture. The plants don't use very much of it um, at a time, and so we're able to constantly recycle the water um, through this closed loop system. Um, it's, it's very simple, but very effective, very conservative. Each plant is individually fed according to its size or growth phase. This is an a la carte menu delivered straight to the roots by an attentive staff. Here are the chemicals. They're all pure. I put this much, this much, this much, this much into water, stir it up feed it to the plants, the plant goes, hmm, thank you very much. And then it also absorbs what we need to, without extras, no heavy metals, no pesticides, no herbicides. Plants are grown under ideal conditions, meaning that you get many more crops per year that way than you would if you planted it outdoors, because we can control everything. The advent of some technologies, the advent of computer monitoring systems so that the solutions maintain a, a near constant level so that the plants get optimum benefit from, the ability for the roof to open and close and ventilate, uh, the ability for us to incorporate underbench heating so that the root balls stay warm. You know, all of these things provide the plant with the optimum growing environment. And what that does then is give us the opportunity to grow 15 to 20 times what people in a dirt-based farm can do using less than 10% of the water. 
And naturally, no pesticides are used. To manage intruders that manage to slip through the technological net, they use an integrated anti-parasitic approach, which, in other words, involves tried and tested old-fashioned methods. I'm just distributing all these ladybugs throughout the greenhouse, and uh, they help us control the aphid population. So they're very beneficial to us, because the aphids, they eat our crops, and so the ladybugs, they eat the aphids, and so uh, we like them, they help us out. Every week we release around 30,000 ladybugs. It doesn't use any chemicals, it's just all very natural. Using ladybugs to fight parasites is impossible in the open fields. The pests are too many, and only pesticides can put a complete stop to invasions. However, in greenhouses, in a completely protected environment, one can obtain abundant crops without the use of chemicals. The vegetables are thus healthier, but cannot be classed as organic, as the standards that define this status require the plants to be grown in earth. No more earth, almost no water. Dixon de Pommier's dream now seems to be within reach. In today's greenhouses, the upper floors are used to grow what will be sold in a few hours' time down below. These pioneers of New York agriculture are already operating like small-scale, mini vertical farms. There's just an extra leap that needs to happen where we actually need to combine the hydroponics on multiple levels in a skyscraper, and that is the next step. What you're looking at is an evolution of an idea. So the, the idea starts as, oh yeah, we should grow food in the city, let's use a rooftop, because it's convenient and easy. So you get these tubs, you fill it with soil, you put the, uh, okay, fine. Well, that's not enough. Let, I tell you what, let's cover it over and make it a greenhouse. And, and that's not enough. Um, okay, then I tell you what, let's make it two stories tall. That's a vertical farm. Then two, three, four, five stories. Who knows how tall you can build them? It's up to the architects and engineers to tell us that. Architects around the world have used scientific advances to create buildings that are ever more exuberant and ever more spectacular. In London or Zagreb, by the sea or inland, we celebrate the birth of a new urban civilization that is both environmentally friendly and technologically advanced. Architects have always been inspired by the world of science and therefore inspired by de Pommier. We wanted to reinvent the scenarios of tomorrow by using contemporary sciences to try and motivate and trigger creativity. We must urgently reinvent the way we improve quality of life through the integration of nature and the reintegration of agricultural cycles. Since then, around the world, in emerging countries, whether in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, in North Africa, in South America, there is a growing global appetite for vertical farms. The aim of vertical agriculture is to save land. There is also the problem of city-states, such as Singapore, Monaco or Luxembourg, which are tiny and very dense countries, limited in terms of their land and thus dependent on neighboring countries. These countries could be the first to construct the vertical farms of tomorrow.